On today's episode of The Unwritten Rule, we got a big show uh, here for you guys to kickstart your weekend. Tons of stuff to talk about. Uh, we're going to start with basketball. We got men's and women's basketball. Both uh, both teams added two new transfers. Uh, the men got Tony Perkins and Marcus Warwick, two guys we've talked about on this show before. We'll also talk John Tanjay because he entered the portal. And then uh, we'll talk about Mark Mitchell. Uh, and Javon Porter, who are the last two guys that Mizzou is is reportedly uh, going to add or most likely going to add here in the next couple of days. So tons of men's basketball, just roster talk. We'll give our takes on Perkins and Warwick, how they might fit. Um, like I said, women's basketball, too. We're going to talk about uh, Lanaya Randall and Naya Wilson, uh, who Robin Pinchton uh, brought in for her squad. We'll probably have some Robin Pinchton talk, too, for for you guys. You know, just some general thoughts on, on that whole sit revisiting that whole situation. Um, but she has brought in two pretty good transfers, so we'll talk about them. Got some football news as well, some stuff on the recruiting trail, uh, a couple guys entering the transfer portal. So um, we'll talk about that, just some some quick hitting stuff. Mizzou's been very active on the recruiting trail for football, so we will keep you updated on who you need to know about there. And then we have a great interview. We're going to kick it. Me and Peyton uh, talk to Karen Steger, the lead editor for Rock M Nation. Uh, we did some softball and gymnastics talk because uh, gymnastics finished their season had a really good year. Softball's having a really good year again. Uh, so we just we talked with Karen. She gave us the lowdown on um, where she thinks softball might finish up, and then summarize gymnastics uh, season as well. So a ton of uh, good content there. It was a great interview. Uh, talked with her for a while. And then we'll finish quick hits. Got jerseys, Shawnee's main birds, and then the best things we learned. So like I said, pack show uh, for you guys to start your weekend. A ton of news, a ton of things uh, going on, and yeah. Uh, before we dive into it, the unwritten rule is presented by Bet Online, which remains your number one source for all your summer sports this season. MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoffs. Got the play-in game going on right now. Our game's going on right now. Sorry for Jimmy Butler. Uh, but all the stats, news, and scores are available to follow your favorite teams. So get the latest odds, lines, and trends, including the la latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. So head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet online where the game starts and the unwritten rule starts right now. I just, I, Marcel, where are you going with that disc? <laughs> you are not putting that on again. Marcel, okay, if you press that button, you are in very, very big trouble. Attention, everybody stop what you're doing. It's time for the unwritten rule, a Mizzou sports podcast brought to you by the Believe Network alongside Peyton Haverman and Kenny Van Doren. Here is your host, Jack Knowlton. Welcome back to The Unwritten Rule. Today is Friday, April 19th, and Mizzou men's basketball has some more uh, signings, some more transfers, guys coming in to try and uh, not have another 0-18 conference season in Columbia, Missouri, um, these the Tigers landed a couple of guys who we've talked about, um, you know, were pretty heavily linked for a while and now have kind of become officially official. Uh, Tony Perkins and then Marquise Warwick from uh, Northern Kentucky. Perkins comes from Iowa. Uh, and, you know, I think these are a couple of guys that Mizzou fans should be pretty excited about. Uh, Perkins started 34 games, averaged 14 points, 4.4 rebounds. Uh, about four and a half assists also averaged about 1.6 steals per game uh, for the Tigers. He comes in and then Warwick from Northern Kentucky averaged uh, 19 points a game, two and a half rebounds, two and a half assists. First team all horizon league with the Norse, of course, uh, the horizon to uh, Mizzou pipeline has become well known under Dennis Gates with, with Hodge and Golston in particular, but uh, we've talked Peyton and Kenny about these two guys a little bit, but to see them finally become official, I think pretty exciting. I think uh, two great building blocks probably. And and I want to talk about this next week uh, when we discuss some like lineup stuff, but two guys will have a big impact here uh, in on Mizzou next season. Yeah. I mean, it's, I find it very interesting that they took both Perkins and uh, Warwick because at like an initial glance, you'd think, Oh, they both kind of play the combo guard role, but they do they do kind of fulfill very different needs. Perkins has a very good assist rate. He can be more of the facilitator. He can run the offense. 
uh, provided that he doesn't, I would assume Dennis Gates sold him on. We're going to probably let you run more of the point uh, because you don't have a very high turnover rate. You can handle the ball um, very well. You can facilitate. And he probably won't be doing as much of the ISO, ISO ball that he was doing uh, at Iowa, which he was relatively efficient there. So it, it wasn't a huge issue, but um, I would expect that maybe to be a little lessened so he can play just more of a true point role. Um, Warwick is kind of uh, the rock M guys have kind of put it best. I know Matt J Harris, uh, put this comp out there. Um, he, he kind of is more of like a Sean East in, in that, like he can handle the ball really well. His turnover rate is also actually pretty solid, but his assist rate is pretty low. So he's not going to be a guy that comes in and plays the one he's going to be more of your Sean East, like can kind of slash to the rim, uh, maybe, be a bit more of a isolate iso ball player. Um, so it, the fit is definitely there. And then you throw Tamar Bates is back in there. I'm sure Ant is going to still get plenty of minutes uh, at the one. Uh, you can go a lot of different ways with, with the lineups, which is something we said last year and it didn't end very well. But these guys do look a bit more encouraging than the Kurt Lewis's of the world. Yeah, the, the thing for me about Tony Perkins is like, you look at a guy coming out of the portal from a, a power five school, power four school now in Iowa. And when you think about where Mizzou has gone the last couple of years, it's like, let's get a guy who barely played at the power five level, you know, who was a guy who was the sixth man, seventh man off the bench. Tony Perkins averaged 14 points. And I think that's the, the good, you know, building block that Peyton was talking about. You want a guy with a lot of experience and Tony Perkins is that guy. Um, you want to go in the portal after a year you lost 19 games in conference play and you want someone that can, I, I mean, take you over that hump, actually win games, and actually have a uh, above 500 record this next season. And I think that's the, the good thing you want to see that Dennis really hasn't lost his recruiting ways. And after a year that he really missed on a lot of guys in the recruiting yeah, I, I think Peyton, you like you make an interesting point with two guards. I think in this day and age, it's like one of those things where you just kind of can never have enough guards. Like stockpiling isn't a bad uh, thing to do, especially when you don't know necessarily how well each of these guys will translate. Like you said, like on the surface, you know, it's a lot better of additions that I think Mizzou's making compared to uh, what they were doing a season ago and who they were trying to bring in with Dennis getting cute and stuff like that. Oh, I like I like both these guys. I think, uh, you know, I know in rivals transfer rankings, granted that I think is nine days old at this point, but had um, Warwick as the number 20 overall transfer above Perkins. So um, some suggestions there that that, you know, people are high on him and like him to to sort of translate. But, yeah, we'll see kind of where the lineup shakes out for these two guys. Uh, and we'll get to in a second, you know, the the other two that. Mizzou is likely going to add before they're all uh, set and done ahead of the next season. But some exciting stuff like, you know, we're going to talk next week about lineups and, and you know, kind of break down who we think a sort of way too early prediction for where we might see, you know, how this starting five shake out this rotation shake out. Because I think it's an interesting thing when you have all these freshmen and now adding, you know, so many newcomers in the portal. But yeah, Warwick and Perkins over the line, they're coming in. Uh, and and probably expected to uh, to contribute here. I guess let's uh, that's that's an easier segue uh, if we want to talk about the guys who are you know looking more and more likely that they're going to join these two. Um, we we've talked about Javon Porter, but I think maybe the more exciting one for some people and one that got a prediction today from on three, Mark Mitchell from Duke, the forward. Um, he's he had a good season. He was a sophomore at Duke last year. 11, 11 and a half points, six rebounds, and about an assist per game at Duke. Uh, got a crystal ball like you see on screen. Um, or sorry, not a crystal ball. That's not an on three thing. A prediction or whatever to uh, to uh, come to Mizzou from Duke. Uh, I think this would be a very good addition. Six foot eleven power forward. Uh, you know, a good a good big. Or sorry, he's not six eleven. I'm thinking of a. I think I'm thinking of like Marshall, who's taller. But uh, I think he's like six nine. Um, you know, just a good swing forward, played at a high level in Duke with Shire. So what do we think of uh, of Mark Mitchell probably coming through the door here? Uh, this would kind of be the, the big one, uh, assuming this happens. Uh, it's kind of been building, like, 
the info has kind of pointed towards Mark Mitchell trending Missouri for a few days, like ever since K-State. I, ironically, it's been since K-State picked up the crystal ball. It came out that uh, they weren't actually really recruiting him according to their uh According to their kind of report, beat reporters, uh, who knows what really is happening behind the scenes there. But ever since then, it's kind of been trending more Mizzou's way. Uh, this is really, I mean, this guy, uh, Mitchell would be able to, assuming you can get a, a someone that can play the five, Mitchell would come in and probably be able to play like the true four spot. Uh, he gives Missouri pretty much everything they need. Uh, he's super efficient uh, in like around the rim, uh, as you see, he grabs six rebounds. I would kill for a big man that can just grab a few boards a game at this point. This would be really big, assuming you can get enough guys that can space the floor around him, which Tamar Bates kind of flash being a solid three-point shooter. Um, Tony Perkins can hopefully help fill that role. As, assuming you can get a few guys that can knock down a couple threes, which is probably why... Caleb Grill is also coming back into the fold. Um, this would be an absolutely like seamless fit. I mean, I, I this would be the one that excites me the most. Yeah, this kind of goes in what I'm saying that you know, getting Tony Perkins, getting Mark Mitchell, getting guys that started at the Power Five level and not messing around in the portal this year, getting it done early, get these guys signed, get them on campus, get everything going. I think this past year was a wake up call. For what I mean, Dennis could do, and or for what Dennis needs to do, you know, he went out in the portal in his first year, got a lot of guys that a lot of people didn't know, and it, it turned out really well for him. I mean, he beat, beat the odds of what people were giving him the next year. Missed on a couple guys, thought he, the guys he brought in would, you know, facilitate what they lost, and they didn't. And and some of the things that you look at, Mark Mitchell, is that he got to the free throw line a lot more in his second season at Duke, and that was something that really stood out to me. He had 93 attempts in his first season, 159 is in his second season with the Blue Devils. Um, the three-point percentage went down a little bit. I mean, he stopped taking those shots, but uh, field goal percentage, I mean, immensely improved um, across his from his first season to his second season. So there's a lot of things to like about Mark Mitchell moving forward. I'm really intrigued by these, like, and like I said, he's 6'9", just to clarify. I was confused for a second earlier. I'm, I'm very intrigued by these sort of wings that are coming in that play a lot more back to the basket like you said kenny where you know they're not taking as many threes but they're not these bruising seven foot centers and i think i think the free throw rate improving is is good he'll have to continue to kind of make those shots uh when he get when he does get to the line um he averaged six rebounds like peyton said Mizzou, obviously their leading rebounder last year uh, was Noah Carter, who averaged about five. So and and Mitchell wasn't even first on his team in rebounding. He had to contend with Kyle Filipowski, who's a lottery pick. So just kind of imagine all the you know boards he's going to be able to gobble up, uh, you know, with with being in, in the fold for Mizzou and being being like Peyton said, that kind of true four option. Uh, yeah, I really like this one. I don't think you can overstate how nice of an addition this would be and how very much of a refreshing Look, it would be to have Mark Mitchell when you had Jesus Carolero coming in as your power forward uh, transfer last year. How far we've come in a season. Um, quick thoughts, boys, on uh, Javon Porter before we uh, before we segue to uh, or before we talk. I want to talk Tanjay too, like we have on screen. But anything on Porter? He's kind of the other one uh, who Mizzou is. You know, if they're going to get two guys this week, Gabe Diarm and Power Mizzou's kind of seem to report that like it'll be these two. And then they'll probably be done should they get both over the line. So anything on a we're going to we're going to have more Porter talk too. by the way, and quick hits. Don't think we haven't been paying attention to what the another certain Porter brother has been up to. We, we'll talk about that. But uh, anything on Javon before we. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Javon would certainly be a nice uh, addition as well. I mean, because he 611, I mean, he's not quite. Like he he doesn't like he's not like a true uh, like back to the basket five, but that's probably the way Dennis Gates wants it. Uh, he's not afraid to shoot from deep. Um, I think he would also be a pretty good addition. I, I would rather if I had to pick between Mitchell and Porter to get, I'd take Mitchell ten out of ten times. Uh, but Porter certainly would not hurt this team at all. He would probably be a better option at the five than anything that Mizzou got last year, um, which admittedly low bar, but 
I mean, you got up somewhere. You already yeah. have such a good class around him. I think uh, I think that you can make it work. Yeah, I'm gonna play that into the the tweet for the Callum McAndrew shared um, on Tuesday. Uh, he said he just spoke with Mizzou coach Dennis Gates at the Come Home Tour in Jefferson City. Here's something you'll all probably like. I hope to put out about two more bat signals this week, two to three. And, I mean, Porter and Mitchell both kind of fit into that equation if, if that's what he's kind of leaning towards, if he wants two to three um, coming out of this week. Uh, that This is something that I wouldn't have expected Dennis Gates to say two years ago, I think, in his first year. I think that's kind of safe to say. I mean, he's always been more of a reserved guy, doesn't always share too much. But I think he knows like this is like a, a huge and pivotal offseason for him after last year. And that's really just where I kind of go from there is that, you know, he want you know, he wants people to know that there are, you know, greener pastures ahead. I think the other thing, too, is like he loves I think he just loves the recruiting. I think he loves that being a, you know, even even though he's not exactly, you know, online in the style that like someone like Elaine Kiffin is or whatever, you know, he notices it and he notices how much it galvanizes the fan base when he tweets out that bat signal. So I'm actually not like overly shocked that he's leaning into this, especially when you know, you can kind of rack up wins on the recruiting trail after such a disappointing season. You kind of bridge that gap in between, you know, th this past season and next season with, you know, some good news rather than everyone kind of stewing and being like, you know, how are you going to figure this out? I don't know. That's that's we're not trying to tap into the mind of Dennis Gates, but <laughs> that was a cool tweet. And those are probably the two guys. Porter, by the way, 16.2 uh, points, about six rebounds, 1.7 assists, and a block per game at Pepperdine in his uh, in his most recent season there. I'd say he'd be a pretty good uh, gamble, right, for uh, Mizzou to take on here next season? LOL. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right, we'll segue. A guy leaving, uh, we'll touch on this, John Tanjay. Uh, Peyton and I talked last show about how Tanjay and Caleb Grill, of course, were getting those medical red shirts. Peyton just mentioned Caleb Grill uh, might be coming back into the fold for Mizzou. But of course, Peyton, as you so covered and you texted me because that was like hours after we finished recording was when Tanjay announced he'd entered the portal. You were like, good thing I said that's still an option for them because that, I guess, is what Tanjay is choosing to exercise. Um, he's going to enter. He's going to enter the portal uh, instead of coming back to Mizzou after getting that red shirt. Um, played, I believe, in nine games last season, and then he already had a list put out. Uh, he has heard from Virginia, Louisville, Iowa State, New Mexico, Iowa, TCU, DePaul, Arizona State, and Grand Canyon, uh, which is a fake school, so he probably won't go there. But um, thoughts on this? I'm not, I don't think, overly disappointed that Mizzou's going to lose John Tanjay. I don't think you guys are either. It, it, it just never made sense to me to bring back Tanjay and Grill, I never thought that was a logical thing if you were serious about taking a big step forward this year. Not because I don't think Tanjay can be a good player. He could be. I don't think Dennis Gates can take a chance on him coming back and being a productive player. I mean, last year was such an unmitigated disaster. It burned through all the goodwill that he built up. I mean, it like it's there's no other way to put it. I mean, he was going to have to see some results this year. And Grill and Tanjay have both shown they can be good players in the past, but they both got hurt last year. You needed roster spots to really overhaul the roster. One of them had to go. You couldn't take a chance on both of them. And I think Dennis Gates ultimately chose correctly because Grill has shown he can be a high major contributor. Uh, like a very good high major contributor. Um, Tanjay had done it as well, but he had done it at the Mountain West level, which is a good league, but not the Big 12. So I think ultimately it's the right decision for both him and Mizzou. Uh, I think Tanjay, like Knowlton said, that list is pretty good for him. He'll probably land in a good spot. He'll probably be able to be, he'll probably have the chance to be a contributor again. I just think it, didn't make sense for Mizzou to take that chance um, that he didn't come back healthy potentially. But I do hope John Tanjay is able to go somewhere and play well. It, 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 it's not his fault he wasn't good last year. He just couldn't get healthy. Yeah, you don't even know what you're really losing either. I mean, you saw him play in the Mountain West level, but you don't know what he look, was going to look like at the SEC level. Dennis talked really highly of him um, in the summer workouts leading up to 
his first season with the Tigers, his lone season with the Tigers. And my only thing I wanted to mention about the medical red shirt that I didn't get to say because it wasn't on the show is that, you, I mean, getting a medical red shirt never, never means you're coming back. It's mm -hmm. never set in stone whatsoever across any sport in college these days. You look at college football uh, two years ago for the, for the football team at Mizzou, Hiron White got a, a medical red shirt to come back and play offensive tackle for the Tigers. And a couple weeks later, he was in the portal and he was heading to SMU. And so that, that just happens all the time. Um, someone comes for your job. And if Dennis Gates was looking at a bunch of guards, John Tanche didn't really have a job moving forward with the Tigers. And um, I'm, I'm honestly quite you know a little bit surprised that there are a good amount of Power 5 schools on that list. But um, it's very good for him that he has opportunities out there. I think it's always funny, like when a player leaves and goes elsewhere, you know, when it didn't work out at one place, how like a fan base reacts if they do well at another, like if John Tanjay goes to Arizona state and they go to the tournament or something like, I don't know. I'm just throwing a random hypothetical out there. You know, like we saw it with Muhammad Diara. He went to NC state and he was a contributor on a final four team. And I was glad that like, you know, it wasn't, I, I didn't see at least, at least this, I didn't see anything personally where there were people were tweeting like, what the hell, Dennis, how can you keep hold of Diara and unleash his potential in the second season? Like, it's always funny, you know, things just don't work out and, you know, it's maybe John Tanjo will kick on, but I think Peyton's spot on. I, I would have rather have kept grill. They are, again, he could also still enter if he gets that red shirt approved and, and go somewhere else. But, you know, if they do keep grill, I think that'll be a nice addition. He's a good sharp shooting too. Uh, who's already done it at the power five level and, and can turn it up. So um, I, I think you're right on that. And, you know, we wish, uh, we wish John Tanjay the best. Hopefully he can uh, pull it together and stay healthy getting that red shirt season. Um, more transfer talk. We had some stuff on the women's side too, uh, to dive into. Um, Robin Pinchton and company added two transfers. Uh, Lanaya Randall, who is from Southern Illinois. She also spent two seasons at Syracuse. Kenny, shout out. Um, spent this last year at Southern Illinois, averaged 18 and nine and, uh, about one and a half assists. And then Niall Wilson, who they brought in from New Mexico, averaged about 15 and five or four and a half rebounds and about two assists there. Um, two on the service, pretty good transfers for Robin Pinchon and company, which I think, you know, we talked about Dennis Gates kind of being able to bridge the gap from some criticism by getting some wins in the portal. Robin Pinchon, you know, kind of trying to do the same thing after the whole, you know, sort of kerfuffle that that came with the end of last season and the AD leaving and should she have been fired? She couldn't have been fired. Now is adding, you know, two reinforcements that I think are going to be expected to contribute. Peyton, I know, you know, you covered this team last year and, you know, I guess for both of you guys, like thoughts on this seems like they're getting two players, but Robin, for me at least still firmly on the hot seat. Yeah, I don't think there's any dispute about that. I think the only thing that saved her was not having an AD in place. Um, I mean, Lanaya Randall, you can see there, pretty impressive numbers. I mean, those are encouraging. I mean, Southern Illinois was not fantastic in the Mountain uh, Mountain Valley, uh, the Missouri Valley. Uh, but, I mean, 18 and 8, can't really dispute that. 5'11 forward, uh, I do worry about that size a little bit especially in the SEC. Uh, if you if you haven't noticed, South Carolina kind of has big after big after big. Um, so it's it's an incredibly tough league to match up uh, against in the front court. Um, Nia Wilson, um, worry a little about the efficiency there, uh, 41%, but she 35% from three. I mean, that's very good. Um, 15 and five there for... Uh, for, for a guard, I mean, you can probably take that. I mean, they're replacing Mama Dembele, uh, who really took a step forward, but is in the portal as a grad transfer. Um, so two pretty solid pickups for Missouri. Last season, they did not have a very good portal haul. Um, we'll see if these two maybe can kickstart that. I'm impressed Robin was actually able to get anyone with these kind of numbers, uh, considering her job status. Yeah, I, I would say, I think it's fair to say, you know, she's pretty lucky um, for where, where she kind of stands. This, there were a lot of expectations, you know, there were some good recruits that came um, into the women's program the last couple of years and nothing happened. You know, you didn't really get very far in any of the tournaments, SEC or the NCAA tournament. And I mean, these are 
you have to play like you, you don't have a job next year. You have to coach like you don't have a job next year. And I think that's what she's doing. And she's recruiting that way, too. She's going out there and getting probably some of the best options she can. And uh, it looks like, you know, she's trying to take that step forward this year so that she's not on the hot seat moving forward with whoever the new AD is. Because um, at this point, you know, we talked about it with um, – with Cal McAndrew, I mean, she has this job moving forward. It's, you know, he kind of went into like the intricacies of the contract, but I do want to share a quote uh, from our friend, Mari, uh, who's a coach at Prairie state college women's basketball. We've talked about her before um, friend of the show. Uh, we hope to have her on maybe to talk about this team moving forward. Uh, but she uh, added us in this post on X. This is my public apology to coach Finston for my doubt. I've been a fan Plus, looked up to how uh, you run your program. I admit this year it was shaken, but with freshmen staying, class coming in, and transfer portal hits, bravo. Sincerely, Mari. I thought that was a nice nice little note that we could share on the show. Well, and I think that's that's exactly, you know, the thing that, to both of your points, is is really interesting, which was the, you know, the big question is, is you know, when you don't get fired and you don't have some sort of program movement on the surface, it seems like it becomes very hard to recruit because how are you going to, you know, convince kids to come play when, you know, they, they know they read things, they see things like, Oh, this coach might not be here at the end of the season. Why would I stick around a, if I'm at Mizzou already, or why would I be come into a team to play for a coach when they might not be my coach in a season? But yet with these two additions, like Robin has, he has overcome that on the surface and, and, you know, we haven't seen too many players enter the portal on Missouri's end. So, you know, yeah, if, <laughs> I mean, it, it would be a, a super impressive turnaround if, if she could somehow recurry favor from the entire fan base and more importantly from eventually who her AD becomes and, uh, and, you know, the rest of the kind of the Mizzou higher ups there, but yeah, I mean, these are two definitely encouraging additions. Um, you know, this program was, is, is, very fun when it's good. And, uh, you know, the, the, the stat came up again when South Carolina won the national championship, they're like 191 and three or whatever the hell it is in the last four seasons. And one of those losses was to Mizzou and Columbia. So like, you know, you know what happens when this Mizzou team is playing its best with its best talent. Um, the only other thing I'll mention to Peyton, you mentioned mama Dembele replacing her. They got to replace Haley Frank too, after five seasons. And that's, you know, going to be huge. Uh, I mean, she was, she was a, a staple of this program for her entire career. So, you know, where you go with, with someone like that leaving and, uh, and you know, what happens next there will remain to be seen, but yeah, Lanai Randall, I Wilson into uh, the Mizzou program on the women's side. Um, let's segue to uh, talk some football before we kick it to uh, our interview with Karen. Um, couple of quick things here. We got some recruiting uh, and stuff like that to touch on. First one, the four-star linebacker that you see on screen if you're watching on the YouTube. Dante McClellan is his name. Uh, he commits. He is uh, announced his commitment date. He does have Mizzou uh, in his top, what is it, seven uh, schools? No, sorry, top five schools. I can't count. Um, has Mizzou in his top five schools. He commits on April 22nd, 5 o'clock p.m. specifically, if you want to put that in your calendars. Does have a future cast on rivals to Mizzou. He's picking between Michigan State, Mizzou, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Louisville. So some other SEC players uh, in there as well. Um, that's the only commitment. I'll, I guess I'll just I'll, I'll run through this this other one on the recruiting end. Uh, the four another four star linebacker, Javen Boggs, who has Mizzou, he has Mizzou in his top seven. He is taking an OV on June twenty first. So a couple of pretty highly touted linebackers. Peyton and Kenny, I think it's especially interesting. You know, we've mentioned many, many times in the show uh, with a guy like McClellan, I mentioned choosing between Mizzou, Kentucky, Tennessee. That's three SEC programs who you mentioned like clawing up the mountain of trying to be up there with the Alabamas and the Georgias of the world. These are the battles you have to win. Well, Javen Boggs is a receiver. Uh, so did I put, I do, what did I say? Linebacker? You said linebacker, but he is a receiver. What the hell? Um, I mean, he... I mean, Dante McClellan, as you mentioned, he uh, does have a uh, future cast from Gabe DeArmond himself um, to Missouri. Gabe DeArmond does not like to put those out very much. Uh, Javen Boggs, I mean, he's kind of been – he he was the one that – correct me if I'm wrong. I believe Kenny would know this. He was the one that com decommitted from Ohio State, correct? Yep. Okay, so that yeah, the, I mean the recruitment is is red hot for him. I do remember that. Um, I know Matt Zollers um, was uh, quote tweeting him uh, saying he needs to come to Mizzou. 
Uh, I believe he visits in June uh, with Zollers. I think so. I think if you remember last year when Missouri really kind of kicked its class into gear, it was that week in June where they had Juaneri, Nick Rodriguez, you know, all those guys like Brian Huff was there. Uh, they had that big recruiting weekend. Uh, it seems like they're kind of loading up to do that again this summer. Um, it worked last time. Uh, it does seem Missouri is getting a much better head start than last year as well. I mean, they, they should, assuming Gabe DeArmond is correct, and he normally is. Um, Mizzou will have two four-stars, potentially a five-star, depending on who you ask. Uh, uh, they'll have two four-stars at worst to start their class. It's a very good bedrock. Um, we'll see what they can do this summer. Yeah, that, that weekend of the official visits for Mizzou is the Ju is June 21st to 23rd. So you'll start seeing these kind of graphics if you're watching on the YouTube. It's a locked-in graphic. And I told, I think I told Peyton and, and Jack this. Every time I see it, I think it's a commitment graphic. These, <laughs> it does I, I think they need to do something else besides putting a player in a in a jersey and then saying locked in. Uh, yeah, that's the weekend to look out for, though. If you're uh, if you're on Twitter, I mean, we'll we'll mention some big guys too that we see some graphics for. But June 21st or 23rd is that official visit weekend, so one of the final weekends in June. Um, you'll probably start to see some more commitments trickle in. It's the same thing for a lot of programs around all of college football that once you get one of those final OVs in, um, you can really, you know, pers persuade these guys into, you know, believing that this is the program for them. And that's the one to look out for. Yeah. So Mizzou trending in the direction well of, uh, of two four stars. I don't know why I put linebacker next to Javen Boggs's name, but he's a receiver. He's a built so dude. And W he yeah. does look, he kind of looks like a linebacker in that photo. It looks like he can play it. I don't know on the surface. Um, but yeah, anyway, he's a he's a nasty wideouts, um, I guess potential guy there. So um, yeah, a couple of guys, like I said, Dante McClellan, and Javen Boggs that uh, Mizzou is is looking to uh, secure the commitments of, and we'll keep everyone updated on that big weekend in June. Um, let's kick it to ourselves, fellas, or at least kick it to to Peyton and myself. Uh, we talked to Karen Steger from Rock M Nation, uh, one of their lead or their lead editor, uh, had a great conversation with her about softball and gymnastics. Uh, so we'll get you to that interview. Okay, we now welcome on a very special guest. Uh, she is the uh, lead editor at Rock M Nation, a, a publication we use uh, oftentimes uh, in our own um, talkings about Mizzou and stuff. Uh, it's Karen Steger. She writes a ton about Mizzou softball and gymnastics as well, which is uh, what we're going to dive into uh, here with Karen. So thank you so much, Karen, for joining us. We've done well, Peyton, on the on the first time guests in the last couple of yeah. shows. Um, we talked to Matt Michaels, who did a, who did Mizzou. Speaking of, and I want to dive into that second, because uh, it's funny, we talked to Matt right after Mizzou baseball had a historic uh, series win over Florida. And now we're talking to you, Karen, after softball just did the same <laughs> thing. So really preying on the Gators downfall. But we'll get to that in a second, because I want to start. You told us uh, on Twitter when we were setting this up that you have a funny origin story for how you started covering softball. So I'd like to start with that. And first and second off, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you for having me. This is, I think only the second podcast I've ever done. So <laughs> hope I'm not too nervous. <laughs> um, so how I came to cover Mizzou softball, I, I think it was 2021 and they were doing really well. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy tickets to go to regionals and super regionals. And I'm just sitting there on the berm, like with my lawn chair and my log boat snapper, just like enjoying it. And I'm like, you know what? If I'm out here, I should probably start writing about it. So then the rest of the weekend, I brought my iPad with me and <laughs> covered Mizzou softball from the outfield and then would proceed to run over to the student center to get on the post game press conferences. I didn't have credentials or anything at that point. Like I was just like, this seems like a fun thing for me to write about. Like I hadn't really written anything for the site yet that wasn't like links post related. So this was a chance for me to kind of take it over. And, and then I became like a professional, I guess the year after that. And here we are. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so is that just like, were you already with rock M or were you just doing that like for fun off the bat and like just writing it for like, did you have like a personal blog or was it for them? You just were like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to freelance. Um, I already was at Rock M, but at that point I was doing 
mostly just editor stuff and then aggregated okay. links post twice a week. So this was like my first foray into actual sports writing, right. as much sports writing as I do. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's awesome. And and I was reading your column on gymnastics, which we'll get to. So, you know, it's it's come a long way. That's cool that you've been able to kind of build a platform. I think no better way to start a career than with a logboat snapper, too. I mean, you know, right. <laughs> got to do it. <laughs> OK, well, Karen, that is a that is an elite origin story. I have to, you know, I have to credit where credit is due to start with a logboat snapper. And now, um, you know, covering the team. And yeah, let's dive into it. So Mizzou softball having another, you know, great season, uh, you know, as, as per, you know, kind of usual at this point with, uh, with Larissa Anderson in the fold, um, you know, they, they, uh, you know, just your thoughts on that series, obviously it was, it was kind of a historic, uh, victory again, there, similar to what the baseball team just did. Um, it was incredible. I don't think that that's what any of us in the press box really thought was going to happen. It was surprising and amazing how they came together. I mean, going against the pitcher that they faced in game one and then again in game three, and we'll get to the game three struggles. Um, but the pitcher, uh, Keegan Rothrock, like, had just, um, she has like, I can't remember the exact number, a huge amount of complete games on the schedule, had just like knocked off LSU in two out of their three games, has all these incredible wins. Um, she's unbelievable. So I was kind of going into it thinking like maybe they would be able to get to her one of the games i was hoping it was at least going to be the first game so i'm glad that it worked out that way because it kind of seems like that's what that's what happens with mizzou is that like that first series with auburn they got to maddie penta who's like all worldly in the first game and then she kind of got it together for the third game so it was nice that they got it together and like especially with that game in such a weird way like they scored runs in a strange fashion <laughs> until the sixth inning when they actually start getting real hits. Um, but yeah, it was awesome. And then coming back for game two and then getting the first um, series win over Florida, I think in 10 years, like just really great. And doing it with really not that much production from like, Alex Honnold, for example, I think that she had a double on the weekend and then didn't have any other hits and like really wasn't a factor so that some of the freshmen and some of these other players were able to really get in and get the offense going for the Tigers was really great to see. And then the pitching was outstanding, especially Marissa McCann and Taylor Pinnell, CC. I think coach said in game two thought that she pitched the greatest that she'd pitch this far like couldn't be happier for them they it was quite impressive <laughs> and I mean like this team uh, like last year wasn't a, an out and out disaster but I mean compared to what they had been in recent years under Larissa it wasn't like kind of up to their standard I'd say mm -hmm. I mean what has kind of been the key for them to really bounce back and turn into pretty much a consensus borderline top 10 team. I think that they're getting production from more people than they got last year. Like I kind of feel like last year was the Alex Honnold show and then Jenna. And then there really wasn't a whole lot of other action consistently throughout the lineup. Like the seven, eight, nine hole last year, was like just like a black hole. Like they didn't get anything from those people on a consistent basis anyway. And I feel like now you look up and down the lineup and there's people in every slot who can do something. Whether or not they do it is <laughs> remains to be seen, but there there are pieces there. And I think I don't think anybody thought coming in that they would actually I'm sure Larissa would be upset if she heard me say this, but I don't think anyone thought coming in that they were going to have nearly as much success as they did since they only brought in that one transfer, Maya Dodge, 
And she really has been a, almost a non-factor so far, but she's gotten a lot of a lot of production from the freshmen and the pitching staff's been great. So it's cool. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask like specifically there and, and, you know, we should talk about Jenna Laird and Alex Honnold and the stars that have made this team, but you, you know, who has kind of been maybe for the, you know, most part, who's been kind of the biggest, maybe unsung hero uh, on this team. Kaylee Langer. <laughs> Miss <laughs> hit by pitch. <laughs> Um, she is a sophomore last year. She may have batted like maybe twice the whole season. She basically was a pinch runner. Um, and she's firmly in the nine hole now, almost like a whole nother leadoff hitter. She has been so impressive to me. She gets on base no matter how, like she'll do whatever she can to get on base. She's leading the sec and hit by pitches. It's incredible. <laughs> She also hits the ball well. She's a good runner. Like, she's been amazing. Um, and then, of course, like everyone keeps talking about Marissa McCann, freshman from Arizona, who grew up in Columbia, actually, and always wanted to play for Mizzou. Um, she, she has not experienced the freshman struggles like you would think that one would have in the SEC. She has been unbelievable. And – just speaking, you you mentioned like being in the SEC can be like a massive jump. Like Mizzou is still technically under 500 in SEC play. Obviously, I mean that there was like there was a sweep earlier in the in the season against Tennessee, but largely it's been a pretty decent showing for them in what's been what's probably the most competitive league in the sport. I mean, mm -hmm. how has Mizzou kind of navigated that? Especially like you said they've gotten contributions from so many underclassmen uh, that it's honestly that it might even help them more for the future. So just kind of what has been the key for them to be able to be successful so early on? Well, and coach told us that we are not to count the Tennessee series. We're supposed to pretend like it didn't happen uh, <laughs> because it was early on. That was like their first, away series in the sec early on the season they didn't know who they were they didn't know what they were doing um so yeah we're just gonna pretend like that didn't happen. we'll just do what coach says to do um otherwise i think it's that when we've talked to them the players after games and talked to coach after games when they have the most success is when even when they're facing this like ridiculous level of all American pitcher or whatever they're facing. If they're just able to just be themselves, pick one pitch to hit and concentrate on that and not get too far into the, like, Oh my God, we're playing Auburn. Oh my God, it's Florida. Like we have to do this. We have to do this. Like if they just concentrate on themselves and what they have learned, and focusing on one pitch to look for, they have so much more success. Like she told us when they faced Auburn at the beginning of the season, they actually have a pitching machine that is called Penta <laughs> that they had set up just for her, <laughs> just Jeez. so they could get acclimated to her. And it really works. So like I asked her after, I don't know if this, it was this game, if it was this series or the last series, I told her that I noticed that like they were having some problems with adjusting to elite level pitching and what went behind getting them back to that mentality that they had when they faced Maddie Pinta and, and weren't that afraid of her. And she said she really just thought it was like boosting their confidence. Um, another thing that I thought that was really good about this series being at home is they coach was talking about how much time they've spent on the road and how they don't have access to all of their special analytical stuff that they have set up at the ballpark when they're not able to practice. So having 
access to that this this past week, I think was extremely helpful because there's only so much you can do when you're practicing out on the road or like you have midweeks to worry about or something like that. So I think that um, there's a there's a number of reasons why they've been able to be successful. But I think this week, especially a lot of it was to the fact that they did actually get some time at home. I, I think that's really interesting, Karen, that you, you bring up kind of this, you know, not being phased by the, you know, all American pitchers or the big road tests or, uh, you know, kind of the gauntlet that is the SEC, because it was interesting when we were talking to Matt, that's kind of the same approach that he told us Carrick Jackson with the baseball team kind of takes is he tells, he tells his players kind of take it one game at a time. You know, once you're out there, you know, on the diamond with the, with, you know, these players, it's, it's, you know, every game starts at zero. Does Larissa Anderson kind of take, you know, a similar approach to how she sort of establishes that, that culture and stuff for the softball team? Yes, for sure. Um, she preaches that a lot, actually, that it is just one game at a time. We're not worried about tomorrow. We're not worried about next week. We're not worried about the rankings. We're not worried about hosting regionals, like focus on the game right here, right in front of you. Even like coming off of Saturday's series win, she was like, it doesn't matter. Tomorrow, it's a new game. We need to get that out of our system because that's part of the problem that she thinks she's seeing with game three performances, with them struggling in game three, is that they're too high, they're too emotional after like getting multiple wins in a series that's like it's almost like they they're taxed out they're like gassed i think mm -hmm. that's what brandon and i called our recap on <laughs> on sunday because we're like oh that's good yeah let's write that <laughs> yeah it's so, like they just so run that, out of gas <laughs> yeah because you because you mentioned you know you said like oh we'll get into the game three struggles against florida and like you clinch a series like that, it almost feels a little bit like a letdown going into the next one where, right. you know, you got those two big wins. You you beat them for the first time in a series since 2014, but you don't get that third game. You know, it's a, it's almost a momentum shifter, maybe not in favor of the other team, but it's like for you going forward, you're like, you know, oh, sure, we got two, but obviously, you know, Coach Anderson's not going to be satisfied. It's like we could have got three guys like, you know, but you guys put your heads down a little bit, maybe got complacent. Um, I don't think it's necessarily that they get complacent. And I also think that the thing that she keeps reminding us of, like, as you were saying, like, they're facing all these ranked teams still coming up. Like, everybody in the SEC is ranked. Like, it is so hard to win in the SEC. And sweeping a series is, like, just, well, it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> I think so Brandon and I looked back at some history during the middle of the game on Sunday as Mizzou was losing and they've only won on Sundays twice last year in, in SEC series finales the year before they won more but we'll just go last year <laughs> so last year <laughs> That fits my narrative. <laughs> so uh, last year they only won two series finales and they haven't swept an SEC team since 2022. So it's just really hard. It's really hard. Yeah. So I don't really know how they can fix it. She talked a little bit about doing a bit more recovery type of stuff. Um, maybe some like mental work and stuff like that. Like maybe that could help with it, but I think it's still a work in progress because it's something that continues to happen. And yeah, I don't really know how they fix it. <laughs> it's just the sec. It's a gauntlet. It's, it's just the sec. Like <laughs> two years ago, it wasn't a problem. So maybe just go back to that coach. <laughs> Um, and I mean, still looking at it, I mean, you, they're sitting at 33 and 11. I mean, they're going to be a lot for postseason play. Um, I mean, what's kind of the expectation now for this team? Like, what can we really look at and think, 
that could be something they get. Could they host a regional? Like how far can they go into the SEC tournament? Maybe what what can we expect and as maybe a realistic goal for this softball team? Well, hopefully you get a you can get to fourth in the SEC and then you get a bye going into the tournament. Um right. Always but, key. I mean two two years ago they were what one of the last seeds and then they blew through everybody. So clearly they clearly that doesn't matter that much for the SEC tournament. I know that the main goal now is they want to host regionals, especially after like the huge crowds that were on hand this past weekend, like hosting regionals it's and hopefully super regionals is going to be just what they want. And really the expectation for sure is to host a regional and then depending on who your opponent is, make it to super regionals too. So super regionals is, is kind of within is within reach. I, I, I think that'd be super exciting. That's what I wanted to ask about was the, was the crowds. Cause it was a record breaking crowd. I can't remember if it was Saturday or Sunday that I saw, um, you know, and, and it was Saturday that, that it broke the record. And, you know, I guess just as someone who's, who's been on this beat for a while, started literally in the crowd writing <laughs> yourself. I mean, how cool is it to see that? Cause like Mizzou softball stadium, it's one of the, you know, newer ones. It's a nice facility that this, that this team has. And like, it's a fun environment. Like Peyton's been to games. I've called games out there. Like, you know, it's, it's a super fun experience. Obviously when Larissa has this team winning, it's even mm -hmm. better. Um, but, but how cool is it to see, you know, the crowds being drawn in and, and the people, you know, really care. Cause I mean, let's be honest, like for a lot, a lot of years, like Mizzou, if you do a year in review or whatever of all the sports, it's a softball school, you know, in terms of how, mm -hmm. you know, the team that advances furthest, uh, in the postseason and stuff, but what's it like to see, you know, the crowds coming out and, and the students and the people coming, kind of supporting in that volume, if you will. It's awesome. It's also was wonderful that the weather was amazing. I mean, it was like in the eighties, so that helps. it was that does finally help. sunny and the weather was great. I mean, it was a little hot, but <laughs> I can't complain, but just like looking out even from the press box and seeing just the burn just covered was so cool. It was so loud. The fans argued every call. <laughs> <laughs> it was really neat. And then we had talked to Larissa about it all throughout the weekend because I think Friday they had over 3,000 people. Then Saturday was the record. It was like 3,600 or something. And then they had 3,100, I think, again on Sunday. So like it was an all time attendance series record too. It was like over 9,000 people. So it was like something crazy. Yeah. Um, but she said that the way that the park is designed, which I mean, I remember from sitting out on the berm, like how loud it was and how it really did feel like you were on top of the field. But she said when she talks to other coaches, like as far as of her role as I think she's president of NFC NFCA or something like that. Um, people constantly tell her that Mizzou when it's full is really hard to play in because of how close the stands are to the field that it almost oh. feels like they're like on top of you. And when you're out in the outfield and it's loud, she's like, you can't, I don't even know how you can think straight. She's like, it's, it's so loud and it's, really makes it a tough place to play so that i think also is why hosting a regional is like a really big deal because to get all those fans like they're rooting for you like i mean they do so well at home mm -hmm. except for that semo game but we'll forget about that one <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't you can't have them all that that rocks though i didn't know i didn't know that that's how they that that's how they design that 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 rules is it's like you know, you know, as a fan, when you hear that is like, all right, I can, you know, yell my head off and this player, like they're going to be affected by it and have to kind of play through that. That, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, Mizzou softball stadium is great. Um, my last softball question for, before we, I want to touch on a little gymnastics too. Um, my other favorite sport. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but Alex Honnold, Jenna Laird, I mean, the seniors, I, I just kind of, you know, give them the spotlight for a second. I mean, 
what have you seen from them in this year? You know, the production that that we've come to expect is is obvious, but you know, they've been the best players. They're supposed to be the best players. What have you seen from them this season? And kind of to what Peyton asked earlier, for this team to get to host a regional, to get a super regional, you know, where do they need to be in terms of performing at their best? And and what does Mizzou need out of them if if they want to get to, you know, what they've set out to get to? So for Jenna, I think that she's been consistent all season long. She's striking out a little bit more than she was previously, but I think overall she's doing just as well overall and in SEC play as she has in years past. You can count on her to get on base pretty much all the time, or if she's not on base, she's doing something to advance the runner. So I think that she is doing a really good, great job still. And it's kind of crazy about Alex Honnold because I didn't even realize it until I was looking it up last night. I'm pulling up this thing from this takeaways article that Brandon and I have coming out tomorrow. So <laughs> that's okay. That's, that's, that's a unwritten rule. Unwritten rule. 101 is pulling up uh, what you want to read <laughs> at like live. That's not a, that's a, you know, that's a common thing around here. So she's hitting 355 on the season still like outstanding, amazing. But then like when you look at how she's hitting an SEC play, she's only hitting 227, mm -hmm. which is so very un Alex Honnold like from what we have seen <laughs> from these, from her. So like, like I said earlier, like during on the Florida series, she was one for 10. She hit a double. I think she had a hit by pitch. Everybody has a hit by pitch on the Mizzou. They like to hit our batters, apparently. Um, but at the press conference this morning, um, Coach was kind of talking about that. I think that I go on Zoom to the press conferences, so I can't hear the questions half the time mm -hmm. um, because everybody else is in person. Um, but I think that somebody had asked about Honold's performance in the sec and so like we've known from our years of getting to know her that she is a perfectionist and that you know she she's going to do it she's going to play the right way she's going to do what she needs to do to get things done and for whatever reason she's having a harder time this year getting on base in sec play specifically so like her walks have dropped off a lot when she, since SEC's play started, um, mm -hmm. I think she had like 40 something in SEC play last year. And I think she has 15 so far this season. So like that's dropped off significantly. So what Anderson said, I'm gonna pull up her quote exactly. <laughs> um, She's swinging at the pitcher's pitch and not at her pitch. It's just having that discipline and that trust and not panicking, not trying to hit it as hard as you possibly can. And it's that confidence that she needs from us to support her. So it, it she just seems like she's wavering a bit, I guess, in her confidence right now and is going, whereas I don't think she ever did it before. Now she's putting too much pressure on herself to like, Maybe she sees how she did last season and, you know, all American and all these accolades. And now she's like trying too hard. She's pressing too hard to try to do that again. I don't sure. know. She's still making great plays in the field. She had a web gem in center field on, I think it was Saturday and was like incredible. Joe for it just thought it was going to go past her. She got her glove on it. Great job. <laughs> yeah, classic. That's 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 what we come become used to. So hopefully, you know, then she kind of finds her groove there in, in the, the SEC tournament and then it, you know, it clicks at the right time, uh, you know, maybe in these last three series or whatever from from behind the plate. But yeah, plenty of plenty of exciting expectations, I think, from a zoo softball. Larissa Anderson has done wonders with that program. Um Karen, oh, well, let's, and they're uh, yeah. they're so they have three SEC series left. So they're at Georgia. Oh, that's yeah, that's what I was gonna ask is a pretty yeah, quick prediction yeah. for how those three go. Before. So they're at Georgia this weekend. Coaches said that Georgia is like ridiculously hard to win at. So Okay. I'm gonna hope for one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
you know, let's let's go for one. We don't want to get swept, that's for sure. Yeah. And so they're a game in front of Mizzou in the standings. And then the following week is the last home series against Mississippi State, who I think is they might be a half a game behind. So they're everybody's like right there. And then they end at South Carolina, who is lower in the standings. But at one point, I don't think South Carolina is currently ranked, but they they were ranked at one point. So yeah. three important series left for sure. And tomorrow's the last midweek game. Thank God. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not a midweek game fan. <laughs> Not well, also they have them at five o'clock. So it's like, unless I'm gonna like my boss at the J school is amazing, but I can't keep being like, so can I leave early to like go to the softball game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets, he that lets gets me tough. on Fridays. <laughs> yeah, it gets tough. Um, well, yeah, we'll, we'll see how everything fair, pans out, I guess, with uh, with the rest of the regular season and into postseason play. No, no game's easy in the SEC. I mean, it applies yeah. to pretty much any and every sport at this point. Um, I want to segue to gymnastics now, Karen. So I I read your column, kind of recapping the season and all that. My first question. The Taylor Swift column? Yes. Yeah, the last one. <laughs> um, and the first thing I question I had, do we hate Utah? Do we have, like, beef with Utah? Are we – is that there – it seems like I, – I got I took away a lot from your column, but one thing was I feel like we hate Utah. Um. So Utah came under fire – earlier this season as their coach who is still there and still remains employed by Utah came under fire for a lot of former athletes who had left the sport or quit gymnastics or transferred because of his treatment of them. Um, so I never like to see things like that. And gymnastics is a tough sport as it is because like you're staying in pristine shape and keeping your body a certain way is necessary to do the skills and kind of maintain, but there are so many other programs around the country, Mizzou included, that are just much better about it. Like, yeah, not bad people about it. So, yeah. so not a huge fan of Utah because of that. Yeah. Um, but then also, like, they did not have a good meet and it just felt like there wasn't anything that Mizzou could do when the, when the scores got close, that there was no way that, that the judges were going to let Utah advance. So like last year, Mizzou was also in the same regional final as Utah. Yeah. And they beat him. They killed him. It was fine. Like <laughs> I, didn't have, I didn't have any beef with that. I had beef with these judges. <laughs> <laughs> As did a lot of other people. <laughs> yeah, that's what I. That's what I gathered. Um, <laughs> yeah. So all right. No anti Utah and anti refs. That was gonna. That was my other thing. Was the officiating you brought up too? I did also like. So Missouri, obviously, for those that don't know, they came in third uh, in their regional final uh, against Florida, Michigan State, and Utah, I believe, were the other three. Um, I mean, it, it, it's not – obviously, Missouri wanted to go a bit further. The standard has obviously been raised under Coach Welker. Um, but overall, uh, what were your thoughts on the season and where the program – what you expect from the program going forward? Well, and I should say, I am not disappointed with how the season went. I, as well as anybody else that covers the sport, went into regional finals expecting Mizzou to be in a battle for third with Michigan State. Mm -hmm. We did not expect 
them to beat Utah, who made like their 48th consecutive NCAA championship. Like Utah is a blue book, is a blue blood in gymnastics, so is Florida. So them, it was just the way it happened. <laughs> That was irritating. But Mizzou still finished the season ranked number 11, which is the second highest that they've ever been. The only time they've been higher than that was 2022 when they surprised everybody in the universe by making nationals. And they finished that season fifth, one out of making the national finals. So, like, this season was was great. They had program bests on – Three out of four rotations. Beam was scary all season long. Um, but they also lost a lot of people from last year's roster who were the beam people, and they just weren't consistent this year. But, like, I mean, they had three people get tens. They brought in Mara to Tarsali, who will be competing in nationals on Thursday individually. Um it was a fantastic season. It it was awesome. And then like, like them bringing on, so they brought in former J schooler Mason Arneson, mm -hmm. um, is the new sports information director for gymnastics, and he has taken the coverage like to a whole new level. Like I covered those meets last year by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sat right by the floor and Hearns, and there was not a single reporter with me. It was me and all like the Mizzou Stratcom and marketing people. <laughs> and this year, there's been like people there every meet. They do after the homies, they did post game press conferences. He does a weekly call with us every week where they bring in an, another athlete. So, like yesterday, we talked to Shannon and Mara. like the amount of access that we've gotten to them this year has been incredible. And I think that that's really helped get a lot more people on board with talking about them, wanting to go see them, just excited about Mizzou Gymnastics. And it's helped me learn a whole lot about it because I, I mean, thank God for the people I reached out to to help me with that piece that I wrote. <laughs> I did not get the technical stuff. I played it off well, but I asked so many questions. I'm like, what's that deduction? what they do there? That seems like that should have been a 9-9. Nine -nine. <laughs> so I, I was going to say it. <laughs> yeah, it didn't it didn't come off as like you did you didn't know cuz I I do the same thing like I I love watching gymnastics but I'm I see everything and I'm just wowed cuz I just think that like <laughs> you know I'm like if any normal person tried this they would break every bone in their body so they should probably all get tins but like you know <laughs> I get there's a technical side of it too and also I don't mind like it has been a spectacular season I don't mind blaming the refs if that's if that's how we want to if that's how we want to pull it I I don't mind blaming refs that's that's fine with me. Um, well, and, and yeah. I don't, you know, it's hard to know. It also depends upon, like, Florida probably got a little bit of home cooking judging because they were at home. Like, right. it is natural for that to happen. Like, Shannon told us in press conferences, like, when they're home at Hearns and there are five bazillion people there, like, they expect to maybe get a little better scores because the judges may be influenced by the crowd noise or something like that. But Mizzou bringing in, I think their, their overall highest is like 6,000 people versus visiting Florida and it's 15,000 people right. or LSU like who sells out their gymnastics season tickets so it's difficult <laughs> yeah that's a it's a tough environment to adjust to and you're already in the post seat like you're already worried mm -hmm. about postseason and you want to perform at your best and then it's a lot more people and it's at home of one of the other teams you're competing with it's not a neutral site like another ncaa regional stuff like that yeah that's, well, that's i think interesting. at some point they want to they may try to do that sure but i don't think they'll it's kind of like with women's basketball that like mm -hmm. until it get the sport gets built up enough that they're going to have like a big crowd no matter where, where they go they're still going to have these 
home sites. Um, and it's not that, like, I think they're awarded years in advance. So it's mm -hmm. not even like Florida didn't know. Two years ago, they were awarded, you know, that they were going to be hosting this. You don't really know how, I mean, you should know how Florida's going to be, but like, you don't really know. <laughs> right. They weren't a guarantee to be yeah. like, you, you don't know, really yeah, they know might how not Florida's have been going to be at that time. But they were hosting. And anyway. Florida did spend most of their seat, like half of their season drastically underachieving. Oh. And then, and then they got it together. <laughs> Yay for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to ask, you know, just the final thing for me. I mean, you mentioned Mara going to nationals individually. You know, the SEC, I mean, you you take one glance at it. It's kind of similar to softball, and everyone, I feel like, is ranked in the top 15, and it's so competitive, and Mizzou had an outstanding year. Um, who are who are the names carrying this program forward here next year? They can, you know, bounce back and, and get to this point and hopefully, you know, overcome maybe some uh, homer officiating and, and, and maybe reach Nationals <laughs> as a team next year. Yeah. Um, well, sadly, <laughs> Sienna Schreiber can't change her name and re-enroll at Mizzou and – be here for four more years. She has finally run out of eligibility and she's the, she's, I mean, anybody that's leaving is a big loss, but she's like the biggest of the big losses because she's been an all American. She had 10 this year. She's been the all around the main all around person for four years now. So her leaving is, is sad. <laughs> um, but like, Mara, who is competing on Thursday. Um, she's already announced that she's coming back um, for another year. There's a couple more that we aren't sure about. Um, but then like Amari Celestine, who does, and Jocelyn Moore, I mean, they do incredible gymnastics on like three different apparatuses, like just yeah. amazing. Um, Addison Lawrence, who was a big bean person last year as a freshman, she'll be back next year. She was out with a hip injury this whole season, so it'll be great to have her back. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Um, <laughs> the freshmen this year have been so good and some of them didn't even get in as, into Miss Mini lineups because the depth is so crazy at some of the events that, like, they very easily could have gone to another program and, like, gotten right in the starting lineup. But there's, sure. like, literally no space for them <laughs> in, in Mizzou's lineup currently. So, like, Hannah Horton, she was a big one for Mizzou on floor and um, vault. Like, she's... She was just a freshman. Kennedy Griffin ended up doing three different events by the end of the season. She's incredible. She won. She won. She tied for the win in the regional final in floor with a nine nine five, and she is a freshman. Jeez. And like not like one of the like freshmen that everybody in the whole country talked about. Like she was like a relatively unknown three-star freshman and just like had a phenomenal season um Raina light she another freshman that can do any any event um also huge like there's so many people coming back they have a top 10 recruiting class coming in um their first i think coach said their first five star recruit is coming in and that's the only other five star they've ever had is Amari. So that's amazing. They have all these people, they have a girl coming in that was on the Finnish national team who deferred oh. this year so that she could possibly be in the Olympics. Um, she's incre obviously incredible. <laughs> she can yeah. be in the Olympics. <laughs> um, no, Suni Lee situation. That's huge. Yeah. So they have, it's just, it was the most fun to cover. And I'm already like, okay, is it next season yet? I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. And sounds like they're in, they're in, you know, good hands for the future. So, you know, we'll have you, you know, you'll come back on in a year and this time we'll be previewing nationals as a team yes. instead of, <laughs> instead of a recap. So, um, yeah, well, 
Karen, thank you so much. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have you back on shoot. You, you, you'll go to Oklahoma city. We'll have you back on then, you know, when, when you follow Mizzou to, to the college world series that how about, awesome. how about, yeah, let's do that. You could have me um, and Brandon on together. There we go. Yeah. Brandon. Current guest. <laughs> we, t- we tag team a lot of our pieces when we're together in the press box. We've been having the best time. I'm yeah, like, we're the dream works. softball team. And then, then I'm like, I mean, we're the only people that both cover it, but you know, that's besides the point. We're the best. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Um, well, yeah, we'll definitely have you back on again, um, you know, soon. We'll preview preview some stuff, talk Mizzou gym, more softball. Definitely if they, for sure, if they go to the, the World Series or, you know, maybe even if they're super regional, we'll have you do like a, a game preview for us. Yeah, that would be awesome. This right, cool. um, was not as painful as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> No, coming on the coming on the pod. You did you did yeah. great. It's not a <laughs> we we tried to, the unwritten rule is not a scary. Uh, it's hopefully not a scary place. So yeah, um, well, we appreciate it, Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, quick hits time. Everyone's favorite portion of the show. Jersey of the week. We start with Kenny. What's your jersey of the week? Uh, my jersey of the week. Goes to former Mizzou pitcher Tanner Houck, who threw a Maddox on Wednesday for the Boston Red Sox. Former uh, 2017 first round pick of the Red Sox, still with Boston. Very cool to see Tanner Houck throw a Maddox because, in my opinion, and I think Peyton might might agree with this, that Maddoxes are a lot cooler than no hitters at this point because there's no hitters galore um, in Major League Baseball in the last five to ten years. Maddox is a lot cooler for those that don't know. It's a complete game by a pitcher. Um, with under 100 pitches and gets the name from Greg Maddox. And that's the I think I think it's a, a really cool, um, really cool achievement for Tanner Houck. No, it definitely is, especially with this age of pitchers like going five or six innings. I mean, it's it, it, it's a lot more uncommon uh, nowadays. I mean, I can't even remember the last one. I remember the last one a Cubs pitcher threw. It was Kyle Hendricks in like 2019 or something like that against the Cardinals. But yeah, they're pretty rare. I don't know if I'd quite say they're cooler than no hitters. I do still love me a no hitter, um, uh, whether it be combined or just one pitcher. But Maddox's are undeniably cool. Um, And on top of it, it was a shutout. So that's even more impressive to me. Yeah, I uh, totally knew what a Maddox was before Kenny explained it. Uh, trying to now that he now that he emphasized it again, it's one. even cooler. Is there no like just list? The, the list is weird because it's out of order. Oh, that's dumb. so. It's Maddox's by team. Oh, oh it's really dumb. Um, the most recent I know there was one by a Cardinal because we had a actually had a uh, a class Ooh, for oh. one of our journalism classes that they talked about the Maddox. It was a, oh, you're right. It was written by Katie Wu, um, who covers the Cardinals for the Athletic. The last one was from Valdez on August first, twenty twenty three. Coincidentally, that was also a no hitter. Well, there you go. Two, there's two missed, for one. Domingo Herman one. threw one um, in his perfect game, ninety nine pitches. Wow, efficient. Uh, I, I love I love efficient efficient baseball stats are are fun. Yeah. All well, right, Peyton. Not very efficient anymore. <laughs> All right, it's time to address the elephant in the room. Jonte Porter is my jersey of the week. He has been banned for life from the NBA for violating the league's gam- gambling rules. I know he says gaming rules, but it's because he was betting on games. I mean, look, there's no way around it. You read what he did. It's pretty undeniable and inexcusable. He bet on the Raptors to lose. Uh, if I if I did read correctly, it was a game he wasn't playing in. Um, it was. To begin with that he bet on them to lose, which way to really stand behind your teammates there, Jonte. But yeah, I mean, he's, I, I don't think I've seen anyone be banned from, nobody's been banned from the league for this, for sure. And I don't think I've seen anyone in general be banned from the league. Uh, Nolton, you would know this, but. People have been happened. banned for the league for gambling before, I think. Oh, who? Uh, not anyone. I think he was the first one that's gotten a lifetime ban. I looked it up. I'm looking it up again. I think for gambling, the last guy was in like the sixties. Oh, okay. Cause I know they've had the, 
the ref scandal, like with Tim Donaghy and all that. But um, I couldn't think of a player that had ever had this happen. But and actually, yeah. you're right because most of them, most of those bannings for gambling happened when they were point shaving in college. That was right. where a lot of them got. So like it happened in college, and they mm-hmm. went to the NBA. They got banned. So yeah, outright NBA. That I don't know. This is. Let's see if he. Oh, he's been added to the list officially. The last. Actually, I kind of want you guys to guess this. Who's the last player to be banned from the NBA permanently for anything? Donald Sterling. Well, okay, a player, Peyton. <laughs> and actually, saying, this was uh, after, Donald Sterling this was, couldn't play. This was after Donald Sterling too. So this even this player was run our test. No, after after run our test. Or Tyreek <laughs> Evans. I remember he got suspended for something. Nope, he was not permanently banned. Was this player still playing when he was permanently banned? Yes, Lamar uh, Odom. Nope. Greg Odin. Nope. I have no idea. Then I don't know. Uh, at the time, he was playing for the Milwaukee Bucks. You probably know him better for his time on the Memphis Grizzlies. It is O.J. Mayo. Oh. What did he do? On July 1st, 2016, Mayo was banned for violating the NBA's sub- substance abuse policy by smoking marijuana and abusing painkillers. He was eligible to, He was eligible to apply for reinstatement in 2018, but has not returned to the NBA. Yeah, I think at this point, that ship has sailed for old Mayo. Yeah. Um, the juice. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty disappointing. I mean, he was really, I, if I'm not mistaken, he was kind of catching on with the Raptors. He was. I mean, he was kind of carving out a role. Uh, so pretty sad to see him throw it away like that. Uh, Payne, you were right. Uh, this family probably needs a documentary. It does. I, I think Chase. Oh, is. Someone, yeah, someone said that, and I, I think it's worth it now after this. This is ridiculous. <laughs> It's just uh, it's Port- something new every week with this family. It feels like uh, Porter averaged. He had appeared in 26 games for Toronto, started five of them, about four and a half points and three rebounds and two assists a game. Uh, he also in the release, it said they like put out his winnings. So all the bets he put in, I think it said he it's with stuff ranging from 15 to like 20 grand. I think the total amount of money he could have won was about seventy six thousand dollars. He ended up winning about $21,000. So he threw his entire career away for about 21 grand. And uh, yeah, now can never be dumb again. <laughs> yeah, it's very dumb. Play overseas. Um, I don't hate the, um, I don't hate the, I, I guess I'll get y'all's take on this too. Cause I don't hate the people who are pointing out the irony of banning a guy for life. When this part of a large portion of this league and it's TV correspondence are sponsored by betting companies that is a very like there's not you know, much correlation there i mean yeah. i really don't see it i mean why would you why does that make it okay for players to gamble on their own games yeah i don't it doesn't that, for sure not on that yeah, yeah on the i don't game. really think there's a correlation there i'm gonna be honest i get the irony of it I it think is, that, yeah. yeah, it's ironic that they're they're doing that. And you got to remember at the end of the day, it's, I mean, yeah, it's a game and people respect the game. It's a business. I mean, they're, they're going to make money any way they can. Yeah. And if you're going to, I mean, exploit the game in any way that the league, I mean, has it banned, I mean, you're, you're done. I mean, there's no way around this. And I, I, I just don't understand how you can be this, just this dumb. I know gambling is an addiction. It's something that, you know, people have actual problems with and there's people out there to help you but I just don't know how you could think that you could get away with this. I mean, that we are in a day and age where there are computers watching everything you do. And I That's just think the, that was very foolish of what Jonte did. Yeah. wasn't there. I don't remember how much it was, but someone, someone put like 80 grand on his like under and stuff because he said he was going to be sick. Like what, like, were you thinking that wasn't going to get flagged, man? Like you're like a role player on the Raptors. <laughs> and that's a lot of money. It's like the Alabama baseball coach and his bookie. Jack, the vid- you're talking about the eighty thousand dollars on the under. Did you watch a video about that? No, I thought I saw it in a release, but maybe. Okay, maybe there I was, was a, there was a video that someone made pretending to be it. And I thought they were just messing around with, the, with that number. I thought there was a big bet place. Maybe it wasn't that amount of money, so I could be totally wrong. But I thought I I thought I saw something either in the release that they did, or it was someone said that someone put a big bet. He had someone put a big bet on his. Uh, like stats and he like mm-hmm. who said he was sick and so he didn't play um if that's fake oh, i yeah. guess it is but you know he's banned he's banned either way so um 
yeah, tough, tough beat for old Jonte. We'll see. I don't know. Mizzou, bring him on as assistant. He's not banned from basketball. GA? <laughs> not a good look. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think he can play overseas. Just yeah, yeah. that's Let one thousand percent what he's gonna do. Just finish out his basketball career somewhere else. Which overseas, I know in sports, they're uh, a lot less harsh on if you bet on games. There's a soccer player who he's only been suspended for like a year. He can come right back for betting on games. So <laughs> right. it's not a, as much of an issue over there. Career's not derailed. Yeah, tough beat for Jonte. I'll, I'll lay off a little bit, but anyway, um, my jersey of the week not nearly as like wild of a story but uh i just saw this on twitter and i thought it was interesting um i'm giving it to this san diego state receiver uh mahjong Wright, i believe is how you say his na- name um he's going to his seventh stop in college football he has had stints at arizona middle tennessee arizona again blinn college which i believe is where cam newton went to school uh when he left florida grambling and then san diego state and now he's off to somewhere else um, I like the end of that tweet. JT Daniels walked some, uh, Majon Wright could run. Um, welcome to the modern age of college football folks. This is what you, this is what you see nowadays. we got that Miami guy, uh, who's entering, I think his ninth year of football. And now oh, you got this guy. Um, might be Just time to give it up, man. I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Seven schools. How like you only listed as a junior. Oh my lord, he could do this again. He had I, don't 50. Know. I mean, good lord, this is just an insane. He didn't even play at San Diego State. He didn't play a snap there. Um, so I don't know. Like eventually you got to think like there are guys that always enter the portal. School never comes calling. Uh I do wonder at a certain point if this is what this guy's going to run into. Um but god it's remarkable. I love seeing like players that just transfer this much. I don't like seeing like players that have been in for like seven years, but it is funny to see that he's been at seven different schools. Yeah, that's wild. I don't know. The fact that it is Arizona twice, he came back to, he's like, yeah, the Arizona middle Tennessee, Arizona pipeline there. <laughs> it's real. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see what we'll see what the future holds for Mahjon Wright. Uh, next segment. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for I it. I like no cap, and he's the main bird. There it is. Shawnee's main bird of the week. Uh, Kenny, what's your main bird? Uh, my Sean used to main bird of the week is Kurt Lewis, um, former Mizzou bench player. Uh, the connection is that he knows Sean East, and I think that's a fair connection to do. Um, he's also going to East Tennessee, Sean East Tennessee State University. Um, <laughs> final run. This is the last run for Kurt Lewis, um, Juco product. Got to the SEC, didn't really work out with the Tigers. Uh, probably have a better role, though, at East Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, he can probably go and be a contributor there. Good for him. He just wasn't I, – I don't think he was a high major player. Uh, it was worth a try. Uh, the Juco route somewhat worked for Dennis with uh, uh, for East – uh, East blossomed this season, but I don't think he could see if Shawnee or uh, Kurt Lewis would uh, undergo undergo rather a similar growth. I will fully put my hand up. I was convinced Kurt Lewis was going to be like how Sean ended up last year. I thought he was going to be a much better contributor. Came from the same JUCO, didn't work out. Hand up. I was wrong on that, I guess. But uh, he was good at uh, Eastern Kentucky, which is where he was before he went to JUCO. He like wasn't even. He like could have he had high major looks after that and then decided to go JUCO and then come back up. So, yeah, East Tennessee State, best of luck to you, Mr. Lewis. But unfortunate that it did not work out for you uh, with the Tigers. Peyton, what's your main bird? My main bird of the week uh, is going to be the Colorado Rockies and Kyle Freeland in general. Uh, my connection to a bird is that the Rockies are a team in Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball has the Cardinals, Orioles. No. No, you have a, oh. such a better bird connection for Kyle Freeland. I was going to say, surely he played for a bird team. He played for Team USA. Oh, that's <laughs> right. Um, so there you go. He played the for Eagles. Team USA. Uh, the the uh, dirty birds themselves, or the main birds themselves, rather. Um, the Rockies, they used him as a pinch runner at, for, for the go-ahead run in the ninth inning. Uh, surprise, surprise, it did not work. He was thrown out at home. Uh, on a passed ball 
and he got injured on the play. He did eventually return to the dugout. I don't think he went on the IL even. Um, but good lord, the Rockies are four and fifteen this year. Um, I thought he broke his arm. Really? Hmm. I thought I thought I read somewhere that he broke his arm. But maybe I maybe that was wrong. No, I don't think he did. I think he's perfectly fine uh, now. So there you go. He's also been really terrible this year. Uh, but there you go. Rockies are doing some silly things. Really great stats there. They might as well see if he can just run the bases. <laughs> this is what I want my job to be if I ever played baseball. Is like just a pinch runner. That's all I do is just steal bases. Run around. No hitting. Aaron no did it. Yeah. Just do that. Any thoughts, Jimmy? Kenny? <laughs> yeah, he reached a thousand innings. Um, one thing I just don't like about this is that he's given up more hits than innings pitched. <laughs> always just be kind of a <laughs> Jeez. hard look. Kyle Freeland was a first round pick. Never forget. He was an eighth overall pick in 2014. I believe he was fourth in Cy Young voting in 2018. Uh, when he he was really good that year, but um, it has just been a bit of a tailspin since. Yep, fourth in Cy Young in 2018. Spent his whole career with Colorado. Loyal. Gotta yeah, I don't know. He should probably have not done that. <laughs> but yeah, who knows? Um, all right, my main bird of the week uh, is going out to the folks of X.com bird connection formerly known as twitter i'm giving it to everyone on x who decided to dunk on greg doyle who if you haven't seen uh the clips and don't know who greg doyle is or what happened uh basically he works for the indianapolis star uh who he was of course covering the caitlin clark like introductory press conference after she got drafted to the fever and he asked her a question. And it's just, like, I don't even, it's too cringy to even like go through. He, he made the little like heart hand gesture at her because she does that to like her parents and stuff. Then just it was asked her a very just bad, like very bad interaction. Uh, you can go watch it on Twitter or wherever else you want. Um, it got picked up, put everywhere, and he was just getting ratioed by people uh, left and right. Then he decided the, most intelligent thing to do is to write a column about it, which um, people did not like understandably. So, so Greg, not, not good, man. Uh, I don't know. You guys can give your thoughts on this if you want, but just, it was just really bad behavior, really bad look for just media and journalists too. This guy's just an old columnist. And yeah. So good. the situation was he, he, he flashed like the heart hands at Caitlin Clark. Um, you know, the heart hand gesture, uh, just to, and Kenny's got it going on right now. Um, Caitlin Clark, uh, was like, Oh, you like when I do that? And like, after explaining why she does it and he's like, yeah, if you do it to me, uh, we're going to get along just fine. And I, uh, oh, God. even just saying it just is, cr- it just sounds gross. I know he probably, he, I do believe he didn't mean it for it to sound so creepy, but it did. And his apology was then followed up with a column that kind of made it all about him. And I don't, it was just not handled well by him. Um, uh, he, it should have just been, Hey, I didn't mean for it to come off that way. Uh, it's re- it was stupid. My apologies. Uh, but he just, it was handled poorly. It was really cringy to listen to. Like it, uh, my skin was crawling. I was like, yeah, Ugh. but yeah. It's secondhand embarrassment. It's yep. very unfortunate. You know, you want to drag the guy as much as you want, but I mean, it, it, he's mentioned it in here. Like this has happened multiple times, and like I just in the world of journalism, how do you just not grow from that? And I know that yeah. people are different the way they are, but you can't just you know point it on yourself and make this you know into a column, and everyone's gonna come at you and say you know you're making money off of an incident that you you had, and and that's the thing at the end of the day. It's you know apologize. And just kind of move forward, you know, try to be better the next time, be outspoken about being better, being different and not treating, you know, a female athlete any different from a male athlete. You know, they're all everyone is striving for the same goal in, in this industry. And um, no matter you know how they look, you know, where they play, what court they play on, you know, what uniform they wear, it's you know, they're all the same. Everyone's the same in that sense. And there's just no reason to do that. And, you know, 
you know, older people maybe a little bit odd. You know, I think you can say that too. But, you know, she's like, I just don't know how you don't grow and change from these previous. Uh, you can see it on the screen for watching on YouTube. He said he's done weird things before. How right. have you not just gotten better and realized, you know, that you th this is a problem you have and you just need to just ask the question. That's all you're doing. You're, you're a voice for the people that aren't there. That's all you are. You're not a fan. You are not. And you don't have to have any relationship with these athletes. You just need to take what the information, the news is, and give it to people through these press conferences. And that's all you are. You are a vessel for the truth. Yeah, that's uh, that's my like weird thing is like uh, why you, uh, all three of us like, you know, we and we take this kind of personally and we should like we're all members of the media. We all do different things. We've been in press conferences before. Why people ever try and do something more than just asking a question in a presser? I will I will never understand it like never goes over well. It's, you know, like, I don't know, just just bad behavior overall. I think you I guys said it. Well, yeah. Yeah, I don't think like. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with like having a good rapport with like yeah. who you're covering. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it, it, trying to be way too friendly that quickly is just pretty, pretty yuck. And it just was a bad situation all around. Yeah. Bad look. And like Kenny said, seems like Greg Doyle was not, ha is not very well liked among the Indiana sports community. People have read his work probably more frequently. So, yeah, just a weird moment. My favorite part to end it on this is the people who are making fun of the fact that uh, he spells both Greg and Doyle wrong, spelling Greg with two G's and Doyle, D-O-Y-E-L instead of L-E. Those were some <laughs> of my favorite tweets. It was just the they're dunking on him for his name. But, yeah, bad look. Um, Kaylin Clark, though, uh, is going to get her own signature shoe at Nike to end on a more positive note. That's exciting. It'd be, be cool, cool to see what, uh, what comes out for that. But... Greg Doyle, not good. Not good uh, behavior from you, sir. Uh, best thing you learned, Peyton, segueing. Best thing I learned this week, I mean, I did not know this guy was still technically not in the portal or that he even had eligibility left. But Dennis Jackson, the uh, Ole Miss transfer that came in, we thought maybe he might be able to get some snaps. He dropped a ball against Kansas State and was never seen again. Um he officially entered the transfer portal. It was previously reported that he had left the team in the middle of the year. Um, so I, I was surprised he wasn't already in it. Uh, he was a four-star recruit in the class of 2019. So Dennis Jackson in particular uh, was my best thing I learned because I just didn't even know he was still technically uh, at Mizzou. He's our age. That's the craziest well, part about all this. He graduated high school and we graduated high school in 2019. And now he could be going on his sixth year of college. Um, the one thing I, I asked some of the guys around the team and on the beats that he wasn't listed on the roster at all this spring. And, you know, presumably we didn't think he was anywhere near Columbia. We thought he had moved on and maybe he wasn't <laughs> even in Columbia, but he officially entered the portal. And I was told that he kind of did the same thing at Ole Miss. He, he entered the portal like on the night before the first game for Ole Miss in 2022. So it's just – very strange uh, last couple of years for Dennis Jackson. Yeah, hopefully he lands somewhere. I don't. I don't know. That, that's just fine. We didn't even think he was in Columbia. Yeah. Thought he was long gone. There's there he's popped up. Um, yeah, he's transferring and also to a, a lump in another one. Kenny, help me pronounce his name again because I'll be honest. It's Tonkara. Serenier. 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 Tonkara. He's also transferring. I, I won't front. I have not heard of this dude and did, was not aware of his presence on the Mizzou team, but he did not play. I don't think last season. He, he kind of had a little bit of buzz. Uh, did he? he wasn't, I mean, he had a little buzz coming out of high school. I remember um, he had, I, I think the coaches might, Kenny would know more about this than I did. I thought I remember the coaches saying some nice things about him, but he wasn't really going to play this year. So, I mean, it's more of just a matter of, I want to play. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer. His coach left too, his recruiter. Um, Kevin Peoples is no longer with the program, but he's a part of the, the there was a kind of like a small um, group of guys from like Houston in the class of 2023. And Tonkara was one of them, along with Marquise Johnson, who who had the tie to Mizzou. Yes, his dad played for the team, but he's also living in the Houston area. So I remember there were some photos um, before the Gas Bowl in 2022 about some of the coaches heading down to Houston before they went to Florida with the team. And um, he was one of the guys they went to see. 
maybe he goes a little bit closer to home. If you look at the the tweet from Brandon Howard of Rivals, did have those offers from TCU and SMU. If those come back on, if they hit the table again, maybe he gets a little bit closer to home. No doubt, no doubt. Um, yeah, hopefully he, hopefully him and Dennis Jackson both stick uh, and and find a spot to get some minutes. Kenny, what did you learn this week, sir? Um, best thing I learned this week, it actually happened last week. Uh, we didn't, I couldn't get it slipping into the show last Friday, but this uh, comes from Callum McAndrew. Dennis Gates says freshman interval team could, could, could potentially play the national anthem on the saxophone before one of Mizzou's games next season. Uh, he said, I'm claiming Star Spangled Banner Boateng right now, by the way. That's mine. Uh, we should maybe reply to Callum and say that I claimed this before him and I own the rights to that trademark, Star Spangled Boateng. Do you own the rights to the trademark? I trademarked it. It's uh, it's in the process. <laughs> oh, well, uh, lying. you're lying. Yeah, I, I might buy it. It's it's uh, it's open to the public domain, so I, I might buy the <laughs> trademarks to it. Are you going to do Star Spangled is... Banner Boateng or just Star Spangled Boateng? I think I'm going to do Star Spangled Banner Boateng. Oh, because like Banor, Anor. That's actually like mm -hmm. close to Star Oh, Spangled. Star Spangled Anor Boateng. There we go. That's what the I think Star I'm going to do. Star Spangled Anor. Uh, but yeah, this is this is pretty fun. I always like when athletes can do the national anthem. You see it around minor league baseball a lot. There's actually a guy in the Astros system named Luke Berryhill who uh, sings country music, and he's done the national anthem a couple times, even in spring training for the Astros. And it, it, to see this, like to see Anna Voting perform the national anthem on a saxophone before the game, one, I hope it doesn't tire him out because that kind of sounds like it's a lot of work just for one person to do that song. Um, two. It's sick as hell. Like that would be that pretty baller. Sick. He comes out and then drops like 15 um, and dunks on some Arkansas player's head. I think that would be really cool. No, 100%. Uh, I would kill to see this. Um, yeah. I, like you said, it's cool when athletes can do something like this. Uh, I, I think Dennis Gates also said he could like play the trumpet with him or something like that. Uh, but he wouldn't do that before oh. a game. He w wasn't going to do that. Oh, Come on, Dennis. Yeah, this would be fun. Uh, I think we should do that. They should do that and then have Peyton Marshall descend from the Raptors in the Truman suit and then just get out of it. <laughs> be like, surprise, I'm starting. Um, no, that's that's good for good for Andor. The multi-talent is uh, is pretty fun. Maybe we'll see him uh, take out the saxophone. I don't know. Whoever's carrying forward the Sternberg scoop, that'd be a good behind-the-scenes uh, flip down the road. But... Good for Anno Botang. Hopefully, he sings the national anthem. My best thing I learned this week, more of just a just a a, a relearn or relive, I don't know, type type thing. Um, Mizzou football posted an edit and just like a long video going in depth about the fourth and seventeen play against Florida that kind of saved the Tigers' chances at a at a New Year's Six Bowl. If you're not if you don't remember that iconic play by now. Um, it was just awesome. It was a well-filmed video. The the Mizzou, um, I'm I'm a big fan of what the Mizzou creative team uh, is able to pull together, and they they did it again. There were some cool interviews in this. Uh, talked to Brady Cook. Uh, Kirby Moore was fun. He was like breaking it down, kind of behind the scenes. There was a clip of Harrison Mevis, uh, and I think it was Makai Miller too, where Makai Miller said like, "Yeah, he walked up right before he made the field goal and was like, I got this, no problem. Like we're like we're good." And I, I always I thought that was cool. They just like kind of went went a little behind the scenes, did a little deep dive of the drive, the build up to it, and it was all cinematic. And it was just bringing back all of the memories of like pacing around my house watching this game, you know, feeling nervous about the the bull hopes dying at the hands of Florida and a backup quarterback in Florida. It was such a dramatic moment. I'm so excited for next season, boys. This is this is like it was it was a fun it was a fun year. And it was, good, it was a good moment to relive. Yeah, I mean, that that Florida game was probably, that was kind of like we felt like might have been a little bit of a trap game. It almost was, but they got through it. Um, I did like that Drinkwitz pointed out the last catch of, the, of that drive, the Mookie Cooper one on the sideline was such an under talked about one because I've always kind of felt the same. Mm. Like it got them like another 20 or so yards. Um, and kind of made it more of like a like I think Drinkwitz said made it pretty much a layup uh so it was a cool video I always I like hot behind the scenes moments like this they should do one for me this is uh 61 yarder um I would watch that as well um 
one last thing to note is it was posted on April 17th, 4th and 17th. Right, right. That the was best the, thing about it. The bit, yeah, yeah. So happy 4th and 17th, belated, I guess, because we're recording this on 418. But yeah, Mizzou football, um, I'm so excited. They, I want them to go to the playoffs so bad. Uh, all right, let's end the show on that note. Peyton? This so, one comes from our favorite TV series, The Today Show. Uh, guys, how do mice floss their teeth? With Swiss cheese. No, you're almost there. Shredded cheese. Almost, both of uh, you. With string cheese. String cheese. Ah, uh, there you go. That's pretty Very good. nice. That's pretty good. That's it. Nice. All right. Well, on the show there, uh, thank you to Karen for coming on as well. We'll have her back on, like me and Peyton said, before uh, if uh, Mizzou goes to Oklahoma City, pre- little, do a little World Series preview. Um, and yeah, hope everyone has a fun and safe weekend. Oh, I didn't say this at the top of the show, so everyone skip here. Maybe I'll put it in a comment or whatever. We're going to do stadium renderings next show just because we had a lot to talk about. And this is our this was already a, a longer show for you guys. We did get the stadium renderings today while we were recording this on Thursday but we're going to talk about those in Monday's show. So we will have a review of Mizzou. We've got our thoughts. We're going to stew on it over the weekend and, and, and get back to you guys. So that will be in a show. Uh, we just didn't want to include it now because we already had a lot to talk about. Anyway, thank you to Ben Online uh, for sponsoring the show. We'll see you guys on Monday.